Hello, and welcome back to Into the Killing. This is the second episode of our two-part series on the Bear Brook Murders. If you haven't already listened to the first episode, we highly recommend you do that first. Here's a refresher on what we learned last week. Four bodies were found in two barrels on private property near Bear Brook State Park in Allenstown, New Hampshire over the span of 15 years. One of the victims was an adult woman and the other three were young girls. The youngest and the oldest girls were related to the adult woman. Then the police found out that the middle child was the daughter of a man who went by the name Curtis Kimball. The police also found out that Curtis Kimball used the aliases Bob Evans, Larry Vanner, and Gordon Jensen. In the last episode, we talked about Denise Bowden, who went missing after Thanksgiving in 1981. At the time, her boyfriend was Bob Evans, who was of course Curtis Kimball. In the 1980s, Curtis Kimball abandoned a five-year-old girl named Lisa, whom he had sexually abused. In June 2003, Curtis Kimball was sentenced to 15 years in prison after pleading guilty to killing his then-girlfriend on son June. In this episode, we're going to string all these stories together. We'll explain how Curtis Kimball's true identity was discovered and who his victims were. In November 1988, a man going by the name Jerry Mockerman was arrested in San Luis Obispo, California. He had been driving a car that had been stolen nearly a thousand miles away in Preston, Idaho. Mockerman was arrested and fingerprinted. While he was in custody, the police ran his fingerprints and discovered that he was really Gordon Jensen, aka Curtis Kimball. Jensen was wanted for child abandonment and for sexually abusing Lisa. At the time, no one was sure who Lisa was. Kimball claimed that was his daughter, but he had lied about everything in his life. The police were planning on doing a paternity test to see if Lisa was really related to him. A blood sample was taken from Lisa. But for reasons that aren't clear, a blood sample wasn't taken from Curtis Kimball. Peter Headley, one of the investigators on the Bear Brook case, explains what he thinks happened in New Hampshire Public Radio's podcast about the case. He thinks that Kimball avoided a blood test by agreeing to a plea. In May 1989, Kimball pleaded guilty to child abandonment and the other charges, like child molestation and car theft, were dismissed. When that happened, the paternity test wasn't done because it wasn't crucial to the case. Kimball was sentenced to three years in prison. In 1990, Curtis Kimball was paroled and he promptly left for places unknown. No one is really sure what he did for the next nine years. He popped back up again in late 1999 as Larry Vanner. Hun Sun Jun introduced him as her boyfriend to friends and family on New Year's Eve 2000. A year and a half later, they were married in a Star Trek themed wedding in their backyard. However, there is no legal record of the marriage, so it was not an official wedding. In June 2002, Hun Sun Jun disappeared. A few months later, in September 2002, Vanner was arrested and identified as Curtis Kimball. In June 2003, Kimball pleaded guilty to June's murder and he was sentenced to 15 years to life. After Detective Roxanne Grunheim reviewed Kimball's past, she realized that there was a huge unanswered question in the case. Who was Lisa, the girl Kimball abandoned in June 1986? Grunheim got in contact with the Sheriff's Department in San Bernardino, California. They had a sample of Lisa's blood that was taken for the paternity test back in 1989. A DNA profile was made and was compared to Kimball's DNA. 
they had no familial relationship. If Curtis Kimball wasn't Lisa's father, then who were her parents? And how come they never reported her missing? Lisa, who was now in her early 20s, was interviewed. She pointed out that Kimball abandoned her when she was just five years old. So she didn't remember much of her life before living in foster care after she was abandoned, and she didn't remember much about Kimball. In December 2010, Curtis Kimball, a.k.a. Larry Vanner, a.k.a. Gordon Jensen, a.k.a. Jerry Mockerman, died of natural causes in prison. What he knew about Lisa's identity and her parents, he took to the grave with him. We'll return to the investigation of Lisa's identity after a short break to talk about our fantastic sponsor, Audible. I've been a huge fan of Audible for years. In my Audible library, I have 177 titles. Last year, I listened to 38 titles, and I can't wait to listen to more this year. Usually, I throw on Audible while I'm doing chores, like washing the dishes. When I'm listening to a really good title, I actually look forward to doing my chores because I get to listen to Audible. Audible not only has audiobooks in every genre imaginable, but they also have original podcasts and titles that will help you exercise and guide you in meditation. They also have unique and exclusive series like Words and Music. Words and Music features some of the world's best musical artists telling some fascinating personal stories and playing some never-heard-before music. Not too long ago, Audible launched Audible Plus. With Audible Plus, you can access thousands of titles, including audiobooks, podcasts, and series like Words and Music that you can listen without limits. You can listen offline, anytime, and anywhere. Firstly, I love listening to Audible on my Alexa device. I can recommend dozens of titles on Audible, but one audiobook I really enjoyed, I think you'll like as well, is Columbine by Dave Cullen. The Columbine Massacre is one of the most well-known crimes in modern history. Dave Cullen's examination of the crime, including the lead-up and the aftermath, is shocking because the media got so many aspects of the story wrong. For example, many people think that the shooters were bullied and they lashed out at their aggressors. Yes, there were some bullies at Columbine High School, but you'll be surprised at who they were. Columbine is absolutely riveting, and I could talk about it for hours. But why listen to me talk about it? Sign up for Audible today and listen to Columbine yourself. Visit audible.com slash listed or text listed to 500-500 to start your free 30-day trial. Once again, for your free 30-day trial, check out audible.com slash listed, that's A-U-D, I-B-L-E dot com slash L-I-S-T-E-D or text L-I-S-T-E-D to 500-500. Find something great to listen to and help support Criminal Listed by checking out Audible. In 2013, Detective Peter Headley with the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department was working on trying to determine Lisa's identity. Sometime the following year, Lisa suggested putting her DNA profile into an ancestry database like 23andMe. She thought that some of her relatives may have submitted their DNA to the database. Helly submitted Lisa's DNA into several DNA databases, but none of Lisa's close relatives has submitted their DNA to the databases. Helly wasn't discouraged because he thought an Ancestry database might help solve the case. Edley then emailed a website called dnaadoption.com and a woman named Barbara Ray Venter read the email. Ray Venter was born in New Zealand but attended post-secondary school in the United States. She got a Juris Doctor degree from the University of Texas at Austin Law School and her PhD in Biochemistry at the University of California, San Diego. According to her website, she was an intellectual property attorney who specialized in patenting biotechnology inventions. In 2012, Ray Venter, who is now retired, put her DNA into one of the Ancestry databases. She connected with a cousin she didn't know existed who lived in the United Kingdom. 
That cousin was a 70-year-old man. He told Ray Venter that he got a huge shock when he put his DNA into the database. It turned out that the man he thought was his father had not actually fathered him. Ray Venter tried to help her cousin and came across a website called DNAadoption.com. The website offered classes on how adopted people could find their blood relatives through DNA databases. The process is called genetic genealogy. The theory behind genetic genealogy is that if you go back, all humans are related. Essentially, we're all cousins at some level. According to 23andMe, if the average person has two to three kids, then a typical person would have nearly 200 third cousins, 954th cousins, and 4,705th cousins. In genetic genealogy, you find the cousin with the closest relationship or the biggest cluster of distant cousins, and then you start filling out their family trees. This is often done through records like birth certificates, marriage licenses, and land deeds, just to name a few. Eventually, if the searcher is lucky enough, they will find their birth parents' immediate family. Then it's a matter of just determining who is the best candidate. For example, if someone was looking for their birth mother and they trace the family tree to a family with three children and there's only one female in the family who was in her childbearing years in the year that person was born, then that person is most likely their birth mother. We're just going to take one more quick break to bring you a word from our other amazing sponsor, Shudder. I started watching the streaming service Shudder a few years ago because the series Channel Zero was recommended to me. Channel Zero quickly became one of my favorite series. It's a haunting and unique horror anthology and all four seasons are available on Shudder. That was just the start of my adventure on Shudder. They have the largest, fastest growing human curated selection of thrilling and dangerous entertainment. Shudder has movies and series in every subgenre of horror and thriller. They have huge Hollywood hits like Sinister and It Follows that call classics like The Beyond and Maniac Cop. Shudder also has amazing original movies like Revenge and The Summer of 84 and series like Blood Machines and Creepshow. You will not find anything like their originals on any other streaming service. Because of their awesome collection, Shudder is known as the Netflix of horror. Truthfully, I'm a bit overwhelmed when it comes to recommending what to watch on Shudder because there are so many amazing things to watch. Personally, I love old B-film horror movies and you won't find a better collection of those than on Shudder. One of my personal favorites is the 1980s cult classic, Maniac. The movie has a haunting edge to it that even after 40 years is still disturbing. And if disturbing serial killer movies are your thing, you have to watch Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer which is also available on Shudder. It stars Michael Rooker for The Walking Dead and Guardians of the Galaxy as Henry Lee Lucas. I saw this movie decades ago, and I still haven't forgotten some of the scenes in it. You get all this for just $5.99 a month, or $56.99 for a year. Shudder is also incredibly accessible, and is available on many different devices, like your iPhone, iPad, Google Chromecast, or you can do what I do, and stream it using your Amazon Fire TV. Get started streaming the best horror, thriller, and supernatural content. Shudder's expertly curated collection includes must-see titles like Color of Space, Hosts, The Mortuary Collections, plus the best horror documentaries, and the hit Creepshow TV series from executive producer Greg Nicotero of The Walking Dead. To try Shudder free for 30 days, go to Shudder.com and use the promo code listed. Once again, for your free 30-day trial of Shudder, go to Shudder.com, that's S-H-U-D-D-E-R.com, and use the promo code listed, L-I-S-T-E-D. So please check out Shudder, because I guarantee you'll find something great to watch, and you'll be supporting Criminally Listed. Ray Venter took a class on DNAadoption.com, and it turned out that she had a talent for tracking down people's relatives. She started volunteering at DNAadoption.com and eventually she started teaching the class that taught her genetic genealogy. 
She also answered emails for the website. When Detective Peter Headley emailed the website, Ray Venter was the person who read his email. Headley wanted to know if it was possible if genetic genealogy could be used to find Lisa's family. Ray Venter said that the technique could work, but it would be difficult. People who were adopted who are looking for their blood relatives usually know what city, or at the very least, what state their adoption took place. With Lisa, there was truly little to go on. After trying a few databases, they found a fourth and fifth cousin of Lisa. When someone is your fifth cousin, that means they have the same great, 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 great grandparents as you. Nevertheless, Ray Venter and her team set to work trying to figure out Lisa's identity. They worked throughout 2015 into 2016. In total, they spent 10,000 hours working on it. But by the summer of 2016, they had determined Lisa's identity. Her name was Don Bowden. Her family last saw her when she was six months old on Thanksgiving 1981. That Thanksgiving, her mother, Denise Bowden, brought her boyfriend, Bob Evans, to meet her family. After that Thanksgiving, Denise and Don's family never saw them again. Bob Evans also disappeared from the area. According to work records, Evans reappeared two and a half years later in March 1984. He was hired under the name Curtis Mayo Kimball at an electrical company in Los Alamitos, California. Two and a half years after that, he abandoned Lisa, whose real name is, of course, Don Bowden. The police in New Hampshire were quite sure that Bob Evans was really Curtis Kimball, but they wanted to remove any doubt. It turned out that Evans had been arrested a few times while he lived in New Hampshire. So the police had his fingerprints on file. The fingerprints were a match and it confirmed beyond a reasonable doubt that Bob Evans and Curtis Kimball were the same person. Since Bob Evans was his earliest known alias, the police started referring to him by that name. Investigators also called him the Chameleon because of how quickly and fluidly he changed identities. Since Evans had murdered and he clearly had little in the way of a conscience, the police were confident that the Bearbrook victims were killed by him. The police even managed to find more evidence that connected Evans to the bodies. When Evans was living in New Hampshire, he worked on the demolition of a mill. One of Evans' co-workers was the man who owned the store that sat on the lot where the bodies were found. The man allowed materials, like barrels, to be dumped on the property. When the demolition was being done, the store was no longer on the lot because it had burned down. Sometime before the fire, Evans did electrical work on the store. So Evans knew about the lot and knew that it was an area he could dump barrels. Unfortunately, identifying the killer didn't answer the questions regarding the identities of the bodies in the barrels. Also, while the man said his name was Bob Evans, was that his real name? One thing that the police were absolutely sure about was that he used different aliases, so they thought that there was a good chance that it wasn't his real name. Once again, the investigators turned to Barbara Ray Venter, who again used genetic genealogy. She discovered that Bob Evans was born Terry Peter Rasmussen, on December 23, 1943, in Denver, Colorado. This made Rasmussen the first killer to be identified because of genetic genealogy. Knowing his true identity allowed the police to investigate Rasmussen's history, which might hopefully lead to the identities of the bodies in the barrels. Terry Rasmussen attended high school in Arizona. He dropped out in 1961. He joined the Navy, where he was trained as an electrician. 
He served in different bases on the West Coast and in Japan. Rasmussen served in the Navy for six years before he was discharged. In 1968, Rasmussen was living in Hawaii and he got married. The following year, Rasmussen and his wife moved to Phoenix, Arizona. His wife went on to have four children. In 1975, Rasmussen and his wife split up. Rasmussen's family saw him for the last time in 1975 or 1976. When they saw him, he was with a woman, but no one remembered her name or much about her. They did remember that he was living in a place called the Casa del Rey Apartments in Inglewood, Texas. In 1978, Rasmussen worked as an electrician for a construction company called Brown & Root in Houston, Texas. It's unclear how long he worked there, but he left the job in 1978. Later that same year, he moved to Manchester, New Hampshire, and he got work demolishing the Wombach Mill. When he arrived in Manchester, he was using the name Bob Evans. In early 1980, it's believed that Rasmussen was living with a woman who was using the name Elizabeth Evans. However, no one remembers meeting her. What is known is that Rasmussen was arrested at least three times while living in Manchester for minor crimes. On two of the police reports, which were written in February and May 1980, Rasmussen listed his wife as Elizabeth Evans. On the third police report, written in October 1980, his wife's name is enlisted. Also, in January 1980, Rasmussen received a registered letter. Elizabeth Evans signed for the letter. Elizabeth Evans has never been identified and the police aren't sure if she ever existed. At some point in 1980 or 1981, Rasmussen started dating Denise Bowden. In November 1981, Denise and her daughter were seen for the last time at a family Thanksgiving in Manchester, New Hampshire. A few weeks after Thanksgiving, Denise's family went to the home where she was living with Rasmussen, who was going by the name Bob Evans. They discovered that the home was vacant. Then he popped up again using the name Curtis Mayo Kimball in March 1984 in Los Alamitos, California. At the time, he had Denise's daughter, Dawn, with him, but it's unclear if Denise made the move to California with him. In June 1986, in San Bernardino, California, he abandoned Dawn, whom he was calling Lisa. He then used the aliases Jerry Mockerman, Gordon Jensen, and Larry Vanner, and we've already covered that aspect of his life in the last episode. Unfortunately, going through Rasmussen's background did not reveal the identities of the females in the barrels. In fact, it only raised more questions. For example, what happened to Don Bowden's mother, Denise Bowden? Rasmussen most likely killed her, but where are her remains? Also, who was Elizabeth Evans? Did she even exist? If so, what happened to her? She could have been using Bob Evans' name while she was with him and then reverted to her maiden name after she left him. Or did Rasmussen kill her and dispose of her body? Another break in the case wouldn't come until October 2018. That's when New Hampshire Public Radio started releasing a podcast series called Bear Brook which details the case. A professional librarian researcher named Rebecca Heath, who lived in Simsbury, Connecticut, listened to the podcast. Heath had first heard about the Bear Brook case ten years earlier, and for a while, she was obsessed with it. She had spent hours investigating who the four females might be. As she listened to the podcast, she started thinking about a series of posts on Ancestry.com that she came across a few years earlier. The posts were in a forum for people looking for lost relatives. 
The original message was posted in February 2000 and several people had responded. The authors of the post were looking for a woman named Marylise Elizabeth Honeychurch and her two young daughters, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah Lynn McWaters. They were last seen in the late 1970s. Heath checked Marylise and her daughter's birthdays and thought they could have been three of the four bodies of the barrels. Heath belonged to a group of researchers and she wrote a posting about her theory. Her posting didn't generate much of a stir, so she didn't pursue it further. But as Heath listened to the podcast, the more she realized that the three females might be Marilise, Marie, and Sarah. So she went to the postings and managed to get a hold of some of Marilise's siblings. They told her that the last time anyone saw Marilise was in November 1978. Marilise was 24, Marie was nearly 7, and Sarah was 11 months old. They attended a family Thanksgiving celebration in La Puente, California. They remembered that Marilise had a boyfriend with her. It was a man named Terry. Heath also managed to get in contact with the person who made the original posting. Marilise's two children had different fathers, and the person who made the posting was a half-sister of Sarah, who was 11 months old when she went missing. The woman who wrote the original posting said that when they vanished, Marilise was married to a man with the last name Rasmussen. This information convinced Rebecca Heath to contact Detective Peter Headley. Headley passed the information along to Barbara Ray Venter. Ray Venter continued to work on the case. The problem was that the DNA taken from the bodies was severely degraded. Investigators couldn't create a profile from any of the victims that could be uploaded to GEDmatch, which is a DNA database. So the investigators couldn't identify the bodies in the Bear Brook case the same way they identified Lisa, aka Don Bowden. That was until a technique was developed by a paleogeneticist at the University of California, Santa Cruz. He figured out how to get DNA from rootless hair, which previously wasn't possible. The process was then used to get DNA from the Bear Brook victims. The same week that Heath contacted Headley, Ray Venter uploaded the profiles to GEDmatch. Heath's tip got to her the same morning she received the results from uploading the DNA profiles. When the profiles were uploaded, it was determined that the youngest girl was the half-sister of the woman who made the original posting. That meant the youngest girl was Sarah Lynn McWaters. On June 6, 2019, the police announced that the three bodies were Mary Lee's Elizabeth Honeychurch and her daughters, Marie Elizabeth Vaughn and Sarah Lynn McWaters. After the victims were identified, the police began to trace the lives of the mother and daughters. Mary Lee's was born on January 28, 1954, in Connecticut. She grew up in Connecticut, and then when she was 15, she and her mother moved to California. It's believed that they lived in La Mirada, California. In June 1971, Marilise got married. On December 6, 1971, she gave birth to a daughter, Marie Vaughn. In 1971 and 1972, Marilise, her husband, and Marie lived in several different areas of California. In June 1972, the family moved to Stanford, Connecticut. In late winter 1973, they moved to Massachusetts. In July of that year, Marilise's husband took Marie and moved to Lakewood, California. A short time later, Marilise traveled to Lakewood and took her daughter back. Marilise and her husband divorced half a year later in February 1973. 
Seven months later, Marilise remarried in Los Angeles, California. Over the next several years, Marilise, Marie, and her husband lived in various cities in California. On December 13, 1977, Marilise gave birth to a daughter, Sarah McWaters. The following year, Marilise and her husband separated. In August 1978, their divorce was finalized. A month later, Terry Rasmussen's divorce was finalized from his first wife. It is unknown where he was living at this time. But at some point, he had made his way to California. Because in November 1978, Mary Lise introduced her family to Terry Rasmussen at Thanksgiving celebration. After that, Mary Lise's family never saw or heard from her again. It is suspected that soon after Thanksgiving, Mary Lise and her daughters traveled to New Hampshire with Rasmussen. It is believed that Mary Lise, Marie, and Sarah were killed within a year or two of the Thanksgiving where they were last seen alive. So when they were murdered, Mary Lise would have been 26 or 27, Marie would have been 8 to 10, and Sarah would have been 2 or 3. In January 1980, a woman going by the name Elizabeth Evans signed for a certified letter at Rasmussen's home. For the next several months, Rasmussen was arrested twice, and on the arrest records, it lists his wife as Elizabeth Evans. But then in October 1980, his wife is not listed when he's arrested a third time. So a major question is, was Mary Lise using the name Elizabeth? After all, her middle name was Elizabeth. Or was Elizabeth a different woman? Did Elizabeth even exist? In a sense, the Bearbrook case is considered solved because we know who killed the victims. But so many questions linger besides the identity of Elizabeth Evans. Some of the biggest questions are, who is the middle girl and where did she come from? What is known is that she's Terry Rasmussen's biological daughter. In February 2020, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a new image of the middle child's face. It's believed that she was two to four years old so it's thought she was born between 1975 and 1977. She was white, but she has some Asian, African, and Native American ancestry. She was about 3 foot 3 to 3 foot 9. She had brown hair that was slightly wavy. Finally, she may have had a noticeable overbite. It's suspected that her mother was another victim of Rasmussen. Another major question with the case is what happened to Denise Bowden, the mother of Dawn, aka Lisa. Terry Rasmussen has a convoluted history, so you may be wondering, what is his actual body count? Based on the bodies that were found, his victim count would be five. Those are the four bodies in the barrels in Unsung June. Rasmussen also most likely killed Denise Bowden, who hasn't been seen in 40 years. In January 2017, the police searched the home in Manchester where Rasmussen lived with Dawn and Denise. They thought that Rasmussen may have hidden her body in the basement like Unsung June, but they thought he had buried her in the floor. They did not find a trace of Denise Bowden. So it's still unknown what happened to Denise. It's also thought that Rasmussen killed the middle child's mother. It's believed that she is dead, or otherwise, a missing person's report would have been made for the middle girl. So that brings his victim count to seven. Then there's Elizabeth Evans, who may have been killed, or she could have left Rasmussen, or she may not have existed. The police think that Terry Rasmussen killed even more people than we just listed. Notably, when the police talked to Don Bowden after Rasmussen abandoned her, they asked her if she had any siblings. 
She said that she did have siblings, but they had died after eating grass mushrooms on a camping trip. The police don't know if this was just Dawn talking nonsense because she was a child, or she really experienced the death of her siblings because they were murdered by Rasmussen. Beyond those deaths, the police believe that Rasmussen may have killed several other females. In 1980, Rasmussen was living in Manchester, New Hampshire. On March 22, 1980, 15-year-old Rachel Garden walked to a store and then she was heading to her friend's home. She lived in Newton, New Hampshire, which is about 30 miles from Manchester. Sadly, Rachel never made it to her friend's home. Rachel's remains have never been found. A month after Rachel vanished on the night of April 27, 1980, 14-year-old Laureen Ron, who lived in an apartment in Manchester, New Hampshire, had a friend over while her mother was out of town. After her friend fell asleep, Laureen either left the apartment on her own accord or she was kidnapped from the apartment. Laureen was never seen or heard from again. Lorene and her mother lived just two blocks from Rasmussen's house. A month and a half later, on the night of June 8, 1980, 25-year-old Denise Ann Denault was at a social club in Manchester. She left the club alone. After that, she seemingly vanished into thin air. Her neighbor, who lived a few houses away, was Harry Rasmussen. Rasmussen has never been physically linked to any of these disappearances. But the police strongly believe that the serial killer who lived near the young women is responsible for their disappearances. The police believe there are more victims out there because there are large gaps in Rasmussen's history where they don't know where he lived. Sometimes these gaps are years long. He also used five aliases that the police know about, Robert Bob Evans, Curtis Mayo Kimball, Jerry Mockerman, Larry Vanner, and Gordon Jensen. It's highly possible that he used more aliases, so we may never know the full extent of the carnage Terry Rasmussen caused during the 67 years that he roamed the earth. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. Our producer and sound designer is Danelle Cloutier. You can find a link to her Instagram in the description box. A major resource for this episode and the previous episode is the Bear Brook Podcast from New Hampshire Public Radio. We highly recommend checking it out. They have so many more details that we couldn't fit into our summary of the case. If you just discovered our podcast, please check out our channel Grimly Listed on YouTube. We have over 250 videos featuring some riveting and chilling true crime stories. You can find it at youtube.com slash listed. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. In next week's episode, we'll take a look at the first serial killer who was caught because of genetic genealogy. Thanks again for listening. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>